thank you so much for joining us. I am Tina Baker Taylor, Chief Policy Officer at the Digital Chamber of Commerce. And it's my pleasure to be joined today by industry experts Drummond and Reed, Naveed Jafari, and Justin Fisher. Guys, thanks for having or thanks for joining us. Um, we have so much to discuss, so I will ask you gentlemen uh, to creatively introduce yourselves in a Twitter style, please, 240 words or less. Um, tell us about you and your companies. So Drummond, uh, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Um, uh, Evernim is a, uh, a company in the uh, SSI or self-sovereign identity or decentralized identity space. I'm chief trust officer there because uh, it's all about establishing trust uh, online. And uh, I also am a steering committee member of the Trust RIP Foundation, uh, where I uh, co-chair the Governance Stack Working Group and the Concept and Terminology Working Group. So very, very uh, happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Thanks so much. Uh, Naveed, can you tell us a little bit about your company, Paranova, and what you're working on? Sounds great. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, Pier Nova is a uh, data, data, essentially a data quality company, and we focus on digital transformation through data quality. In fact, our mission is to essentially uh, allow financial firms to make confident decisions using high quality data. And uh, I think it's uh, today's conversation around privacy and data protection um, is so paramount um, in terms of you know, what are the principles that go into a good, uh, essentially good data to begin with? And we all know how uh, important of an asset data is to just about any organization. So looking forward to the conversation. Yes, me too. Thanks for joining us. And Justin, uh, you're up next. Tell us about you and Verablock. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Justin Fisher. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Verablock. Uh, we launched in 2019, uh, been development for nearly six years. And we've invented a new consensus protocol that we term proof of proof. And what it essentially does is allows other blockchains to secure themselves up to Bitcoin in a decentralized, trustless, transparent, and permissionless way. And that helps make Bitcoin uh, more eco-friendly. Um, it also allows miners to make more money by securing other blockchains by proxy. And I'm also co-founder and CEO of EMI, uh, em.me is the website. And it's a new liquidity protocol uh, that offers uh, similar uh, attributes to that of Veriblock in that it's decentralized, um, trustless, and transparent. Um, and we encourage you to go look at that. We just announced it Money 2020, and that's an exciting project. So thank you for having me. Awesome. No, it's great to have you. We're thrilled to uh, be joined by all three of you. So I'm going to direct my first question to Naveed, um, but I hope that you will all join in with any thoughts that you might have in follow up. So Naveed, what do you think that um, having the right privacy strategy is more important than technology? Why do you think that? Yeah, well, thank you. So I think much has been said about technology already, and I think we all uh, are well aware of the potential benefits of, uh, you know, blockchain, ML, AI, and, and all kinds of technologies that have obviously helped us to get here. But I think, um, you know, it's, it's so critical to understand where you're going and what you're building before you bring in the technology into this. Because, you know, um, uh, I heard someone recently say that if you put back, you know, what blockchain does, of course, stores information immutably, but if you put bad information, there's bad information forever. And so it's really critical to um, essentially address data quality first. And again, as part of this, this greater strategy before we focus on any given technology, because I think you know we've all been through um, sort of the growth of blockchain as a whole. Uh, and in the last several years, I think we've seen just how critical the technology can be. But at the same time, if it's not coupled with the right um, uh, sort of additional ingredients, if you will, be it strategy or other tools, it, it just doesn't necessarily move the needle. And so um, our thesis is in this, essentially at Pier Nova is to really focus on getting the data, as I mentioned earlier, being your most important asset, getting that right first and then building on that. So there are obviously a plethora of benefits that you could see. And, and again, as I mentioned, we really focus on giving people the ability to make good, confident decisions based on their data. And as it pertains to this conversation, I think I'd just like to add that to me, um, 
you know, again, this is why it's so important to have the right strategy in place first. You know, you can talk about all kinds of frameworks for privacy and data protection, and we all know how critical those things can be. But let's not forget that I think as a building block, it's imperative that we actually store the right information for the subjects that we're talking about. Now, we don't focus on web data, we focus on financial data, but I think the argument is essentially the same, which is let's make sure that we're actually storing the right information about folks before we go into the technology or the strategy to uh, govern it or to use it. So data integrity is far more superior in my mind than anything else. Absolutely, and I'm sure you know that, that we all know that those those uh, types of, of data um, can have some pretty significant compliance and regulatory issues as well. So having that strategy outlined to ensure that you're only capturing what you intend to capture um, and store, I think is pretty critical. Uh, Drummond or, or Justin, do you, do you have anything to add on this? Um, briefly, I think he brings up an interesting point, you know, privacy, um, you know, it's a double-edged sword. So if, if you don't know, if, you know, so for example, if a company has data on you and they have a, a, a privacy protections that, you know, forbid you from seeing what data they have on you, but that data is propagating, you know, that's something that needs to be addressed. I don't know that technology can address that. So I like, I like, uh, excuse me, I like what Naveed is saying about, uh, you know, getting the data right before you inject it into the system and having the right strategy around privacy. Uh, you know, if you've got a hammer, it's not going to do you any good if you need pliers. So you've got to line up the right technology with the right initiative. And I think that starts with a good strategy. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tina, this is, oh, there's a huge amount to, to say about what, how blockchain uh, technology and the cryptography behind it can be put to use to change our situation with privacy and data protection. Um, with the whole area of decentralized identity and self-sovereign uh, identity or SSI, what we're, the primary thrust has been to say uh, with blockchains and you know, what, what the economists call you know, a trust machine, um, the, uh, it's fantastic they solve the double spend problem. Uh, and that's essential obviously for cryptocurrency, but for what we need for self-sovereign identity um, is actually just an even simpler capability, which is the immutable records that can't be um, uh, tampered with. Because what that gives us the ability to do is take conventional PKI, public key infrastructure, and decentralize it and use the blockchains as a source of truth for the public key associated with any actor, a person or an organization uh, or an, a, a thing at IoT. Um, when we can do that, we can start to exchange uh, cryptographically signed statements uh, about those entities, and we call those verifiable credentials. And that's uh, now a two-year-old uh, standard from the W3C. And so this combination of decentralized PKI uses a second standard that's just being uh, completed W3C called DIDs, decentralized identifiers. We democratize cryptography and we make it possible to exchange these uh, verifiable credentials and build trust in a way that we've never been able to uh, before over the internet. And so, so power, on, tell, tell us how, tell us how we're able to build trust. So these decentralized identifiers, I understand they're important, but, but maybe just like, give us an example of in practical daily life for your average person, how will they play a critical role? Yep. So, um, we're, we're all familiar with using these, uh, the digital equivalent of these for cryptocurrencies, right? But I like to ask people, do I use this for money or do I use it for identity, right? I use it for both. Now, for identity, what I need to be ex able to exchange or prove is these credentials. Mm -hmm. um, for money, I've got to have, you know, I've got to have, uh, you know, uh, bills, tokens that I can exchange that are also trusted. Um, but so what we're tackling uh, with, with uh, SSI and DIDs is how do you exchange the credentials? And what DIDs do is they democratize the cryptography that we need so that all of us can be issuers and holders and verifiers of those credentials. And then the verifiable credential standard just standardizes the format and the digital signatures needed on those credentials. And you know, to make this really concrete, this is, I mean, it was theoretical five years ago it's now not only been standardized, but if you take a trip 
an international plane flight this over this holiday season, and you use the IATA travel pass from the International Air Travel Transport Association, you're using a DID. It's it's and that particular case can be on the sovereign blockchain. And you're using a verifiable credential that's standards uh, compliant, and that is what's going to get you across an internet, you know, onto an airline with proof that you have uh, a COVID vaccination or a test. So this is being used, you know, put to use for real world uh, trust infrastructure. And why did I had to choose this technology? Because those credentials actually use zkp technology to um, to reveal only what the verifier absolutely needs to know. The airlines don't want your health information, right? That's a liability to them. They just need to know that you've you, you've got the uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, test or vaccination, so they can meet their regulations. And and this we, we just think this is enormous. This is a sea change for privacy and and digital trust on the internet. Yeah. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, so just um, building on the topic of strategy, um, I'll just ask you each, you know, how, how do firms measure how these strategies are working or if they, in fact, are indeed working? Um, Justin, let, let's start with you. So my original foray into technology um, uh, led me to do computer consulting in the 90s, uh, basically helping companies of all uh, walks digitize. Uh, we helped bring the internet bank to life, uh, consulted on their internet presence, redundancy, et cetera. And every step of the way, um, I looked at all the ramifications of the different, um, uh, to David's point, the strategy that was put in place, particularly by the regulators themselves uh, during an internet age. And the things that I saw them focusing on the time, I, I firmly believe would lead to um, you know, data breaches and the like, understanding the way networks work and where all the holes are. I mean, look, the, the bottom line is, is that the, the biggest hole to any organization from privacy and data, obviously, is going to be the people themselves. Somebody has to have access to that data. And the flip side, uh, to, to, to Drummond's comments earlier, not, not the flip side, but ultimately, even if you are going to put your data on a blockchain, there still needs to be the final authority. There's going to be an oracle of truth, if you will. So all roads are still going to lead back to that. I think it's more about facilitating the sharing of the data. So we're still going to have oracles, government officials, you know, ID bodies, and those are still going to be required to have databases that can still get breached. Um, but certainly less propagation makes it a, a friendlier space. Um, in regards to the health information, uh, you know, for example, the traveling and whatnot, they don't want all my health information, but now they know that uh, I have or have not been vaccinated, which fundamentally I'm sharing my health information with a third party. Um, and then, you know, this becomes more and more granular and more um, uh, invasive and, even, and, and, uh, and gross. So what happens when we look at the risk portfolio of, you know, getting the common flu? And then we start to say, well, did you get your flu shot? Did you get this shot? Did you get that shot? And if there's any chance that there's a risk that somebody could die, you know, where, where's the line where we, we say, okay, we can share this information or not share this information based on the number of deaths that this injury or, or disease can cause. And I understand that's the world we live in. I mean, I, I'd like to live in a world where I know if somebody's sick before I engage them. So there's value there. Um, but it also, you know, what happens when we start taking that to another layer? So as far as the effectiveness of it, I think we've got a long, long way to go. And I think blockchain is, is a key a tool and mechanism that can lend itself to that. So, for example, uh, Ethereum announced, I saw an article on Coindesk, and I've been, I've been tracking Ethereum for quite some time. I was in the ICO. And what I found interesting was the kind of the single sign-on metric um, or ability of Ethereum uh, lends itself to ripping that away, ripping away our identities from corporations uh, that, that have all of our data, then they know where we sign in and who we sign in with and what time that becomes something that uh, we control and, and it helps us take our identity back. So from those perspectives, um, as far as effectiveness is concerned, you know, I, I've, I've watched, I've watched the opposite happen since the late eighties through the nineties, the advent of the internet, I've watched people just chase to give up their privacy and in, in, in doing so giving up people that they know and care about their privacy as well by corresponding with them. So from an effectiveness perspective, I suppose it depends on what you're optimizing for. 
Um, if it's for protecting data, that's a, that's a discussion. If it's in regards to privacy itself, um, I, I think it's just becoming harder and harder uh, to protect one's privacy. And it begets the question, you know, is it time to just say there will be no privacy ever anywhere? No, we can't say that. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe that's the world we're going to live in. <laughs> well, I do think it's interesting, um, you know, when, you know, I'm, I'm talking to my nieces and nephews and they are, um, you know, digitally native and completely used to giving up an enormous amount of information for nothing. Often, you right. know, in, in my uh, perspective, it's it's not a lot of value. Um, but you know, they they've almost been kind of trained that, or the idea that I have nothing to hide. And I think when you're talking about you know handing over your vaccination information, um, it sounds like maybe there's concerns around a slippery slope. And I think maybe going back to the decentralized identifiers, you know, the idea that we can you know partition off um, elements of our health data and only only giving those pieces which are relevant um, is 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 interesting and helpful, but it doesn't necessarily address scope creep. I don't know, Navid, do, do you have any thoughts on effectiveness? Yeah, I mean, it, it, to Justin's point, I think it, it is important what you're trying to accomplish, and then you can, of course, measure against that. And so I think, um, I don't want to make generalized statements, but I think a lot of times uh, companies tend to sort of um, become a little bit more focused on just adopting a certain technology or, or trying to be like everybody else and doing the things in a certain way. But I think it's, it's really, really important that, you know, if, if you look at the, um, the corporate levers, if you will, that what it is that you can actually pull and pull here, I think it all really comes down to risk. And so if, if, if you have certain strategies in place to essentially mitigate your risks, be it financial or reputational, um, then I think you're 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 on the right path, right? And I think you know one of the things I was going to add here is that with digital transformation, I think we all know that there is a uh, a certain negative connotation with the fact that typically they tend to take a long time or or cost a lot more than folks anticipate uh, initially. But at the same time, I think it is so important to have um, that type of a, a mentality that we can't do things the way we've done them in the past. And so we need to find ways to fix these things fundamentally. And so, um, and, and again, it just one of the thing uh, that I think Justin just mentioned as well is that you can have all of these things in place, but if you're not essentially capturing the right data or if you're not capturing the correct data, then does it really matter what kinds of tools uh, you essentially have in place, right? So. Uh, to, to, again, it, I think it all goes back to setting up a good foundation to begin with in order to see, to reap the benefits in the future. So then if we were to look at this in a more holistic fashion um, and a data model that would increase the operational efficiency that we're looking for, meet regulatory requirements, and still enable better business decisions, what are those key ingredients? What does that look like? Well, uh, go ahead, Justin, please. I, I, I was just going to be less than 30 seconds. I would say one of the key principles would be uh, accountability. So as much as I don't like big government and regulations, um, I think that there needs to be, uh, I need to have civil recourse if my privacy is violated. And we need more. I think we could, without it, without um, slowing business down and, you know, cycling competition, because many of the projects right now that are in the billions, you know, they started when it was the wild west and they had no rules. Mm -hmm. And through through their success, we've learned to find out where the where the pitfalls are and how to how to kind of like level the playing field, if you will. So I don't want to say regulations, but I'd like to see some laws that give me uh, recourse in the event that my privacy is violated if I trust uh, an organization. Well, that's a really interesting point. I mean, a very kind of side anecdote. I signed up for something um, whilst I was in the U.S. and gave them my uh, personal information, my email, my address. And 
in my mind, I was thinking, well, I could just unsubscribe out of this if I choose not to want it anymore. Um, and I'm based in Europe, right? And so when I hit unsubscribe here with a European company, I am unsubscribed. And I can also request that they forget me, right? So under GDPR, you have the right to be forgotten. And there are consequences. And there's, you know, different levels of enforcement. But uh, for the most part, these things happen when, when they're requested. Every single day, just just now it's become a like personal joke with me and myself. I unsubscribe from this thing I subscribed to two months ago. And every single day I get an email. So <laughs> they're never going to unsubscribe yeah. me. Well now, now they know your email is now they know your email address works, so they're gonna hit you well, even more. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so I have uh, we have a few more minutes left. Um, I want to just circle back a little bit to the trust factor. So, you know, Drummond, you talked quite a lot about, you know, having that 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 trust element within. So if we're looking at, you know, ZK proofs or we're looking at decentralized um, identifiers. Um, and I think, Justin, it was you um, that was mentioning, you know, we're always going to have, uh, you know, people are at the, at the heart of, of a lot of these strategies. People make mistakes um, and there will always be bad actors out there that are looking to capitalize on that. So understanding all of that um, within this decentralized ecosystem, how do we start to build trust in these systems? Um, I'm, I'm going to quickly, um, uh, it's, it's partially cut off on the screen here, but point to the Trust Over IP uh, logo. Uh, we started Trust Over IP uh, uh, about 20 months ago, um, May of last year, with 27 organizations, and it now has 10 times that many uh, have joined uh, because we believe the future of, of decentralized digital trust infrastructure is very strong. And uh, to perfectly reflect what we've been talking about on this, the Trust RIP stack, it's a four layer stack. Uh, and, and yes, it is a technology stack. It's a it's protocols. And yes, layer one is what we call verifiable data registries, which, which blockchains are a great way, but not the only way to do that. Um, and, and it layers on protocols, for instance, uh, at layer two, um, the, uh, the peer to peer exchange protocol would handle your problem, Tina. Uh, imagine every relationship you form out there, rather than handing out the same email address to all those people, you hand out a DID, a peer did. And when they uh, start uh, not respecting your unsubscribe request, you just cut them off, right? Or you turn around and say, by the way, I'm reporting you, um, and I have cryptographic evidence that you have not uh, um, 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 uh, conform with your, with your privacy policy or what you said you're going to do. So I'm going to give that evidence to the regulator and boy, you're going to see some, right? Anyway, the point is there's a, a technology stack and there's a governance stack. All four layers of the stack have associated governance. This is where we tie in not just regulatory uh, requirements from, from governments, but digital trust ecosystems can set their own requirements, whether it's in financial services or healthcare or travel or education. We have all those initial kinds of uh, digital trust ecosystems forming. And the governance framework is where you set the policy that people and organizations have to implement to provide that accountability that Justin talked about. So only when you bring the two of those together, what we call cryptographic assurance and human accountability, that's how you can build real decentralized trust. Okay. Can I add something to that, if I may? I Please. think, you know, trust is 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 key here, right? And, and you know, I don't want to make it sound like we, we need regulators in order to have trust, but I think as, as uh, the two gentlemen that just mentioned this, that essentially you need that to make sure people are, are behaving. But as a marketer, I mean, it's interesting you shared that, uh, that story with us. As a marketer, I would never want to market to someone who's essentially said, I don't want to hear from you because there is no trust in that relationship, right? And so it, I think trust is, you know, we, we talk about trustless uh, in terms of uh, one of the qualities of blockchain. And again, that's all great, but companies also need to essentially behave in a trusting manner in order for any of these things to work. And so the onus is on every single one of us to be good, cor co good corporate citizens in essence first. And then of course, we're, this does not eliminate bad actors. This doesn't prevent companies from, from doing this, but I think it's about critical mass, right? So if we all agree that there are certain 
essentially there's certain things we are and we are not going to do with data. And this, of course, you're going to need regulators to tell people that are not following the rules that they should follow the rules. But in essence, trust is, in my opinion, is multidimensional here. And so it is really critical that we acknowledge that piece as well. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I think when I, when I use the term regulation, I think what I'm really saying is that I want civil recourse. You know, if, if we have an agreement, I see a contractual obligation. I think what's frustrating is, is that, you know, we get these privacy policies that we're forced to sign just to be able to get Netflix running. And, you know, I've actually read these things. I actually take the time, the guy who takes the time to read it just because I'm fascinated. And it's unsettling what, you know, it's it, like, if it's my hardware, like right now, I challenge anybody with an Android phone to try to make an image backup of it and move your phone. You can't even back up the applications that are on your phone because you don't have root access to your phone. Mm. And, you know, when it talk about privacy, the phone company and, 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 and uh, the corporations that be have more access to my own data on my phone that's accumulating that data than I do. I mean, right now I'm talking to you from a Linux system. I use Linux now. I, I, I finally, I, I took the pain on mostly web-based, most of the things I do, I do from, through Brave Browser, which by the way, I'm gonna plug Brave Browser because um, I serve on a committee with uh, some of the members in, in the Cayman Islands. And I like the browser and I like what they're doing. And I'm, I'm actually doing this call right now, this conference with you uh, through Brave Browser, which does a lot of the heavy lifting on uh, privacy protection, et cetera. So between Linux, you know, open protocols, open, open hardware, uh, open software, you know, that's the only way we're going to achieve the type of control over our data that I see possible. And, and I mean, do you really know what's on your phone or what's in the camera that we're talking on right now? I don't know what's listening to me half the time. I think the, there's an old expression I heard a long time ago, you know, that, um, oh, to your, to your, to your point, uh, Tian, I want to make this one quick comment. If you're not doing anything wrong, then you shouldn't have to be listened to or essentially tracked or monitored, right? It's the opposite. This idea that, you know, I, you know, I'm not doing anything wrong, so go ahead and watch me. I, you know, I come from a different generation, so that's something that I, I, if you're not doing anything wrong, then why are you being watched? Why are you being tracked? So, uh, yeah, I'm getting off topic a little bit, but I, I think about the, the control of my data and I, I'm not really for regulations as much as I am for civil recourse. Like it's my phone. I paid for the hardware. It's my hardware. Am I leasing it or did I buy it? Who owns the phone? So, I mean, that's a, that's a pet peeve of mine too. So maybe we'll, um, maybe we'll I, see I a change there. You make a really important um, point here, you know, as, as we're talking about, you know, data and privacy. And I think it, um, you know, kind of in closing, I'll, I'll, I'll take your closing thoughts on understanding that everything that we just talked about, um, we have to get people, actual people that are using these phones. And, you know, I, I have a big, big issue with Ring um, doorbells and Alexa. I'm like, who's listening to you? You're telling them everything about your life. Like, turn that stuff off. Um, yeah. But but you're having to educate people on the importance of their, their data privacy. Um, because at the end of the day, there are people, you can build whatever, you know, tech stack you want and you can put all of these um, mitigates in place. But if, but if people don't understand how to use them, companies don't understand how to use them. Um, it just feels like there's a bit of an education gap there. Uh, yes, I, Tina, let me just say that uh, at Trust OMP, we started the Human Experience Working Group, and the goal is to um, don't try and push uh, privacy, don't try and make people do things that are unnatural, rather right. take the things that they do naturally and design the technology and the governance to actually then protect their privacy and their data so that they don't have to do, they don't have to learn, they don't have to change their behavior, but the digital world starts to behave more like what they expect from trust and, and privacy. And you know, if we walking around at a mall, we're followed by a set of uh, you know, people looking over our shoulder, the of commercials that you know, uh, do that parody. No one would stand for that, right? And that's exactly what's going on. If you if you look, you know, use one of the tools to, yeah. to show what your browsing behavior is. It's unbelievable how many how much mm -hmm. you're being tracked. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, Navid, you're shaking your head. Do you have any? No, I agree. I absolutely agree. Sorry, I was nodding rather than shaking. <laughs> nodding. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. 
Um, well, it has been a, a fascinating conversation. I could uh, talk about this all day. I'm sorry we didn't get yeah. to dissect my issues with the ring doorbell, but I encourage <laughs> everyone to just disconnect them from your homes, people. Super, super quick button. point. <laughs> Super quick point on that ring doorbell. They're also now using your network and they're creating a mesh network using everybody's uh, Wi-Fi. And it, it was a bleep on the media radar screen. It disappeared. But And I don't have a dog in the fight, but it's unsettling when everybody's ring becomes a node on a mesh network that they didn't necessarily subscribe to. Much That's like the cable company. to end on an uplifting yeah. note. Well, I'm just saying we got we have to be diligent about our privacy. It gets to Naveed's point about it's it's really what your strategy is. So it, I'm very I'm very optimistic about the future living in a, a, a privacyless uh, society. I think it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure to spend the last half an hour with you. Thank you so much. I'll hand it back to you, Tiana. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.